This is northern Idaho, a place filled with majestic forests and cold, clear lakes and rivers. This is the homeland of the Stichwamsh, or discovered people, now known as the Coeur d'Alene Indians. Through the millennia, they have survived through what was provided in nature. And uh, this is something that, you know, when you talk about these certain animals, and that's what uh, some of the elders, you know, we have to think about nature. The relationship between the Indian people, the Coeur d'Alene people, and the animals, the birds, and everything on this earth. Mountains and meadows with huckleberries and camas roots, wetlands and waterfowl and water potatoes, lakes and streams churning with trout and salmon, and forests filled with wildlife. These natural resources remained at close reach and part of one life on earth. Over time, some of these resources have declined. Others have been lost. See, see, a lot of these animals that were when they were growing up, you know, were already extinct. Recently, the Coeur d'Alene tribe has been studying a group of animals whose current status is unknown and whose fate is in question. Forest carnivores. Forest carnivores, it refers to a group of carnivores that are associated with dense multi-layered forests. So the species we're usually talking about are the lynx, the wolverine, the fisher, and the marten. Those last three of which are part of the weasel family. These animals are important to the tribe, uh, mostly just because of the part they play in the overall ecosystem. From what I hear, what they talk about fur, you know, they, they never, the objective of the people come in, especially for beaver. During the era of the fur trade, some of the forest carnivore species were targeted specifically, and they are susceptible to over-harvest. Did you go for for, for, uh, for fur trading because of the the fur uh, is kind of a t temptation for the people to come in for for the fur. And he says uh, all all the all they care is just for the fur, not for the meat. The historical data that we do have comes mostly from uh, trapping records, some from back around the time of the fur trade. Um, and also there is some current data. Uh, martins are currently harvested in the state of Idaho. Um, but there is also a lack of current data as well. Some of these species just don't exist in the levels that they did historically. While many people in this region are unfamiliar with these animals, the Coeur d'Alene's have always had names for them. Fishers are called Tshaships which refers to their long tail, and lynx are called p'anchen. The fur trade did have some impact on the abundance of these animals. Um, some of them were thought to have been trapped out of existence in Idaho, such as the fisher. Uh, there's not many wolverines around. They've also suffered from loss of habitat. And most of these species rely heavily on older aged, multi-layered forest canopies. Not much is known about where they occur or how many there are. Wolverines and Fisher have both recently been petitioned to be listed and the lynx is currently listed as a threatened species. The tribe originally put in for the Tribal Wildlife Grant back in 2006 which is sponsored by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service um, available for tribes to study animals of particular significance. It was a two-year study and we were, we've been able to keep it going for another three or four years just 
due to other agencies cooperating and contributing funds. Well, the development of the methods of this project was a collaborative effort between the tribe and the Forest Service, particularly the Rocky Mountain Research Station, along with partners from Potlatch, Forest Capital, and Idaho Fish and Game. So they all developed these methods together so that other agencies and organizations could do similar projects and then we could combine our results together. So the tribe focused on their Aboriginal territory where, and then afterwards and during the same project, other agencies did similar, similar projects throughout Idaho. The forest carnivores are challenging to study for a lot of reasons. One is that they're solitary animals, so they don't move around in groups, so you're not going to be able to find a large group of them. They also occur in low densities, so there's just not that many around, and they have large home ranges. Also, they live in areas that are really hard to get to, usually for humans, so they live in areas that are pretty remote and in dense forests. So you're really not going to be able to go out and just find and observe forest carnivores. Another issue is that the, particularly the fisher and the marten spend a lot of their time in trees, so they're really hard to find for that reason. And all these are real secretive animals that they're, they're not going to be around when humans are around. So the challenge is, how do you observe these animals that you're just not going to be able to go out there and actually see? So what you have to do is you have to develop methods to detect them without actually being there. Well, in the past, all you could do is put something out there that would detect their presence uh, by signs. So usually there were baited devices that would lure the animal to the spot and where it would leave some tracks, or you'd have a remote camera set up where you would hopefully get their picture. But the problem with those devices were that pictures sometimes, uh, the cameras don't work, and the pictures you get sometimes are ambiguous. Same with tracks. Some of them are really good, but a lot of them are hard to read, so you're never really sure what you got. So in the past 10 or 15 years since um, modern molecular genetics has, has really kind of exploded. Um, we've got new ways to detect them where we don't have to try to read their tracks or take a picture. What we can do is just get some sort of evidence that the animal has been there that has their DNA on it. So uh, methods were developed where you have some sort of lure that would bring the animal to a site where you could hopefully get their hair or their scat, then you could run DNA tests and see what type of animal it was. So that changed things a lot, so no longer did you have to just rely on your skill with uh, interpreting pictures or tracks who actually had DNA proof of the species. For the weasel species, Fisher, Martin, and Wolverine, uh, these traps were developed that are basically just a, it's called a hair snare. What it is is a triangular box made of plastic coated cardboard that has um, wire brushes inside. These wire brushes are designed to grab the animal's hair. The traps were left out for usually about two weeks. Then we'd come back in and see if the trap had been disturbed. Sometimes it would be obviously disturbed by a bear. Other times it wasn't. The idea is that the animal will come in, smell the bait, go into the trap to get the bait, and when it goes through the entrance of the trap, it rubs against the wire brushes, leaves some hair, and then the animal leaves. So then we can come in later and just collect those wire brushes and send the hair in for analysis. The lab we used was the Rocky Mountain Research Station in Missoula, Montana. So since we were surveying two different types of carnivores, we were su surveying members of the weasel family and also a member of the cat family, the lynx, we needed to have a different type of survey for lynx. Um, cats being primarily visual predators, uh, the methods were developed that would lure them in with a visual aid. So what that was was a we used an aluminum pie plate hanging from a tree that would grab their attention. And then there was a, a device nailed to the side of a tree to um, collect their hairs. So the study area we're interested in is the Coeur d'Alene Tribe's Aboriginal area which extends as far north in Idaho as Lake Pend Oreille, Sandpoint area, and, and south to the Clearwater area. And we surveyed just the Idaho portion of it. And so what we did is we first divided that area into townships, so we had a grid. And then within each township, we looked for the, the smaller area that had the best potential habitat for all, these, all four of these carnivores. So when we found that area, we then laid out six hair snares 
near streams in the best habitat within each township. So then what we did for lynx was within a township when we set out the six snares for the other carnivores, if there was also good habitat for lynx, we put two of these lynx stations in there as well. So within each township, we usually set out six traps. And on one of those traps, we also put a trail camera so we could get an idea of what type of animals were interested in the snares. And so we got quite a few pictures of a lot of different species. Beyond our target species, we had ungulates like deer and elk visiting them. We got a lot of coyote and wolf samples. Um, we get birds, uh, quite a bit of cougar activity, and of course bears. Overall, about 15% of the sites were visited by bears. So we feel that that's a pretty, pretty reasonable and something we can deal with. Over the course of four seasons, we set about 860 snares throughout the Aboriginal area. And uh, we got about 5% of those were visited by Fisher and about 11% were from Martin. We didn't get any Wolverine detections, uh, but we did get two lynx detections as well. When we were done, we had a pretty good baseline data for the distribution of Fisher, particularly in the, uh, the St. Joe, the Clearwater, and the Coeur d'Alene Mountains. So the next step was to try to get a better idea on Fisher habitat attributes, um, their home ranges, and their population attributes. So a study was initiated by Idaho Fish and Game, which focused on trapping and collaring Fisher, putting satellite collars on them, and then following their movements to see how they use the landscape. So the tribe got involved in that as well. While Idaho Fish and Game was focused mainly in the Clearwater region, uh, we used our data from our hare snares to do some trapping in the St. Joe area and throughout the, uh, the Aboriginal territory. So within those areas, we usually put between 20 and 30 live traps out there spaced about a mile apart. And the live traps are just a, a big box trap, similar to what you'd use to catch uh, cats or raccoons. And it was baited and checked daily. And if there was a fisher in there, it was uh, anesthetized and then collared with a satellite collar. And we also caught a lot of other species as well. We caught, as was expected, more marten than fisher, and which were released. But we also caught a lot of other animals like snowshoe hares, um, bobcat, and squirrels. All right, we are going to release him. Go, buddy. Yeehaw! So we trapped a total of three fishers over the course of three winters. No, it's going up, huh? And got radio collars on them and have gotten quite a few locations. So immediately we were able to determine the approximate size of their home ranges and how they overlap. And this is being combined with uh, the larger effort down in the Clearwater to get a better understanding of fisher habitat use and population structure. Are you ready? Yep. Over the past four or five years, we feel like we've really increased our knowledge on all of these forest carnivore species. Now, Martin in particular seemed to be very well distributed and fairly abundant. Odds are that um, in the state of Idaho, they'll be, continue to be trapped. We've gathered uh, several hundred positions from the three different fishers that we collared for this project. The two females remained within about 10 square miles of the places that we captured them. Uh, one of the females eventually died and we got the collar back. The other one, the collar ran out of batteries and we never uh, recovered. The male that we collared ended up traveling over 30 miles, um, crossing the St. Joe River a couple of times until his collar eventually ran out of batteries too. And there also appear to be more fisher around than we originally thought, although they're not as common as the marten. It might be that they just have more specific habitat requirements, or that they're just a little slower to expand into new habitats after recovering from the low population numbers in the recent history. We've also recently shifted our focus into looking more for lynx and wolverine by setting remote cameras on some bait stations up in the higher elevations in the St. Joe watershed where they'd be more likely to be found. We have documented one wolverine. 
These two species seem to be very rare in the region, but hopefully we'll continue to learn more about them, as well as some of the other carnivores that make Idaho their home. While much knowledge was gained from this study, there is still much to be learned. This newfound knowledge will be used as baseline data for research projects throughout the region. The Coeur d'Alene tribe will continue to work with their partners to ensure that these species persist in the homeland of the Stichwamsh. <laughs>